I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and here today with me is John Champalia, CEO of Sprott Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to have you. Yeah, nice to be back. Really good to have you back. And, you know, usually when I have you on for these conversations, we're talking about uranium, but we're going in a different direction today with copper. And the occasion is that Sprott Asset Management has just launched the Sprott Copper Miners ETF. So I wondered if we could start a little bit broad, get your take on the copper market, because we haven't spoken about that before, and why this was the right time to launch this ETF. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, we're, we've obviously been, you know, super bullish about uranium for the last three years. And copper is kind of the next metal that we think is a little bit further behind on the curve, but is is very quickly coming into focus for investors. And the reason why it's coming into focus, I think uh, there are a lot of commonalities between uranium and copper, believe it or not. They're both fundamental in terms of their roles in electrification and clean energy. So if you think about uranium, it's obviously very important to produce clean energy with uranium to nuclear power. And copper, I think, is is even more profound just because it is so fundamental. Uh, everything from its role in energy production to energy transmission, electric vehicles, you know, electric cabling. So as the world kind of shifts to this idea of moving away from fossil fuels slowly over the coming decades, we think copper is going to be uh, a very important metal to to really enable uh, those electrif electrification goals from, from happening. Right. And you went straight to one of the questions that I had, which is that, you know, of course, uranium continues to do very well, but I know a lot of people are looking forward and they want to know what's going to be the next uranium. And definitely copper has come up in those discussions. So is it, is it fair to say from your perspective that copper could be the next uranium? Yeah, I mean, they're very different markets. You know, uranium market is about 15 uh, billion dollars a year in terms of sales and, and copper is approaching 200 billion. So they're very different in size and application, but it's, uh, it's quite profound to us when you think about if the goals that countries are stating are, are going to be realized, uh, the amount of copper that we need to pull out of the ground in the next 20, 30 years is about double. And, you know, it's, it's pretty meaningful when you think about we already pull $200 billion dollars out of, of the ground. And I think What's more interesting is that we've been mining copper for, for thousands of years. So it's, I think it's fair to say that mankind has kind of found all the easy stuff. And now we're getting into the challenges of uh, finding the more difficult to mine deposits, which generally are deeper underground, so they're more costly to extract. So, you know, I, I use this analogy with rain because rain it also has a, a supply challenge in front of it. And we think copper has a very similar uh, situation where we need to, in some scenarios, um, in some estimates, almost double the amount of copper being produced uh, over the next, between now and 2050. And it's going to be a real a real challenge because, as I said, all the easy stuff's been found. Right. So certainly some similarities, also differences. I think that does a, a nice job of outlining it. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about the new ETF and what was interesting to me as well is this is actually the second copper ETF that you have. So first came the junior one, and then this seems like more of an expansive one. So I'm interested to know, you know, why the junior one came first and now this one and who each of them might be directed at. Sure. Great question. So we actually have three copper mining ETFs now. Um, the first one we launched in February of 2023, which was the junior. And we, we saw that because, um, we saw that as an interesting first move uh, opportunity for us because there, at the time, there was no junior copper mining ETF you know, anywhere in the world. So we thought, hey, this could be a first to market, which we think is important. There was a lot of M&A activity happening at the time as well amongst junior copper. We expect uh, continued M&A because you know the major, the major, the major miners are very focused on bulking up their exposure to your uh, to copper. And one of the ways, clearly. If a, if a team has, has got a very attractive deposit, they're going to come calling to, to buy it and, and, and to ultimately build it. We then followed up um, just a, a few months ago. We launched a copper mining ETF across Europe. So there's one in Europe as well. And then we rounded out the, the final uh, offering, which is the Sprott copper mining ETF that's listed uh, in the United States. 
And that fund is obviously focused primarily on the, the larger companies. When we designed that fund, what, what, what was really interesting to us is that when you look at um, the 10 largest copper producers by, by volume in the world, most of them are not pure plate copper companies. Uh, some of them are state-owned companies, so you can't actually invest in the world's largest copper producer, which is a Chilean state-owned company. But when you, when you actually pull away the top 10, there's only four of them that are publicly listed and have the majority of their revenue derived from copper. So what we went about in designing this copper uh, index with our partner NASDAQ was really trying to focus on the companies that provide pure play exposure to copper mining. So we've gone company by company in the universe and basically evaluated how much of its revenue or asset base is tied directly to copper mining. And we've really focused on the companies that uh, have at least 50% or more of their revenue tied to copper. So it's a pure play expression. Um, you know, there aren't that many companies that meet that criteria irrespective of how big the copper market is. So we think it's a, a differentiated offering that gives investors more pure play exposure to copper mining. Okay, definitely good to know about that angle. And my apologies for forgetting the third ETF. I think right now is it's a great time for us to be talking about copper really because we've had in recent, just this past week or so, we've seen the price really break out after months and months of inactivity. So I wanted to get your take on what's going on there and see if you can break it down. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Maybe we'll just take a step back and, and talk about um how copper fared relative to other metals last year. And, you know, we will start off and say copper did really well last year and it ended the year up flat in price. And, and, and it did very well relative to nickel and cobalt and lithium, which, which had pretty meaningful price corrections last year, because there have, there is a scarcity of, of copper for sure. We've definitely had some supply challenges, obviously things like Panama and some other mines have signaled that they were going to miss production targets. Um, and what's really been driving demand for copper has not been, you know, traditional industrial uses and construction and things like that. It's been things like electric vehicles, solar farms, uh, obviously building out, you know, infrastructure related to uh, electric vehicle charging, um, things like heat pumps, air conditioning. So, you know, as countries become more wealthy, uh, what what is one of the first things people want? Air conditioner. It uses a lot of copper. So. There's a lot of different applications uh, that copper gets integrated into. And what we see really underpinning the demand recently has been more energy transition related uses versus more you know, traditional industrial uses. Another interesting development that's been helping the copper price in the last few weeks is there appears to be uh, a, a shortage of copper concentrate that is available to, to smelters in China and this is important. People watch this very closely because over half of the copper ends up in China for, for refining and smelting. And right now, the, 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 the costs that the smelters are charging for that refining and smelting uh, step of the process has really collapsed. And the reason why it's collapsed is there's a shortage of concentrate. And that is a very bullish sign reflecting scarcity of, of, of copper, physical copper concentrate in the market. And that's helped the price of copper break through the 9000 dollar metric ton price just in the last few days. Okay. I think it really helps to go over those dynamics. And I think we can go a little bit deeper into supply and demand, maybe starting with supply, because you mentioned, you know, first quantum and Cobra Panama toward the end of last year had to be shut down and that created some disruption in the market. You mentioned the shortages we're seeing now. So I wondered if you can talk about that and maybe how that shows us about supply chain fragility maybe jurisdictional considerations in the copper sector. Yeah, well, I, I'm gonna start off with Chile because Chile is the, the largest producer uh, of copper in the world and that's a state-owned company uh, with the acronym Codelco. Um, and their their production in the last few years has been very challenged, even though they're the number one producer in the world. They're having challenges because some of these mines are coming to end of life. The ore grades uh, have, have fallen off uh, over time. I mean, it wasn't, unheard of to have ore grades 100 years ago that were 5% copper. Now they're sub 1%. So that means you got to move a lot more dirt to get the same amount of, of concentrate out of the ground. Um, there are some challenges with water at some of the locations. Um, Peru has been a, a, a more stable producer. They're number two. 
But we've obviously, if you go around the world, there have been specific mines that um, have had some production issues. Um, in Zambia recently, they're having not issues with the mine, but they're having issues with providing reliable, steady uh, electricity for the mines to operate. So the government has recently said to the so the some of the copper miners there need to curtail your production because you need to cut back on electricity production for the country or consumption. So I think these are very interesting um, signs for investors to see that this market, even though it is very well established, it's very mature, it's very sizable in terms of size, is still vulnerable to different uh, disruptions and supply shocks. Um, and when you're running a very tight market with very low inventories held in warehouses, you you know you can have an, a very immediate supply response, uh, or excuse me, price response, which I think we we've just seen with breaking through that nine thousand uh, dollar net ton mark. But I think the bigger picture is that you know if you talk to some of the large copper miners, they will tell you that the price of copper needs to go up meaningfully higher in order to fund this very significant capital expenditure expenditure uh, required for these very large scale projects. It is not uncommon to have these copper mines cost five to ten or even more billion dollars to build. Uh, these are not small projects, and in order for anybody to make those kinds of capital investments, they need to be assured of a very attractive, profitable, long-term payoff. Um, and that is not is is going to be done, our belief, at copper prices that uh, are much higher than nine thousand a per ton. And I think that's the longer-term thesis that we have. Um, the market may be, you know, more or less balanced in the next few years, but over over the coming years, if the amount of uh, EV adoption plays out, that uh, people expect the ongoing deployment of solar and wind and other technologies that are very copper intensive, we will be in a supply deficit, and that's when the price can really start to move, like we saw in uranium in the last uh, couple of years. Right. I think I think you did a great job of explaining the issues that these existing producers are having right now. I wondered if you can talk a little bit more about the pipeline of exploration and development projects, the the companies that need this these huge amounts of money to move forward. How many actually are like do we have enough out there if there was money that could help us fill this supply gap? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think you know, after a very long period of uh, underinvestment, I would say, in copper mining and exploration development, uh, governments around the world are acknowledging this is a gap. Some countries have put copper on their critical mineral list, which is important because it acknowledges the issue. It also provides a pre preferential treatment to the development and mining of, the, of these particular commodities that could come in the form of lower financing costs or special credits or incentives to encourage uh, copper mining. Now, look, uh, in, in some parts of the world, uh, there's a lot of resistance to copper mining because they're very large scale projects. People don't want these things in their backyard. Uh, but if we are serious about net zero targets and decarbonization and moving away from fossil fuels to more electric uh, sources of energy and energy storage and transmission, uh, we just need a lot more copper. So. You know, I think that is giving a big boost to a lot of the juniors who, if they've gotten the attractive asset, they can finally move these projects forward. And if the senior miners want these projects, we have seen in the last year or so, a number of these projects and companies get acquired at pretty pretty uh, attractive premiums. And I think that's, that's also very important. And it's a little bit different than what we've seen in the gold market, where some of the m a activity in the gold market, the premiums have been very tiny, or they've been kind of merger, mergers of equals. Um, in the copper space, we've seen very good premiums um, for the best projects. Okay. And I wonder, you know, when we look at uranium, and sorry to keep going back to uranium, but there's been such an attitude shift toward uranium and nuclear energy in recent years. And I wonder if you think we need to see more work done there for copper. Because I think I think within mining, people know, yes, we need this for the energy transition. But I don't really know if that is widely known at this point. Well, I can tell you, like, uh, that, you know, different governments around the world are clearly uh, have taken notice. They, they, they have done assessments of what are the critical minerals they need to hit their decarbonization goals and also to build uh, supply chains onshore. So whether they're building... Uh, factories to build electric vehicles, or wind turbines, or 
solar plants or whatever, um, they've done their homework and said, hey, we're going to need a lot more everything from, from you know, copper to cobalt to lithium to nickel um, and, you know, things like uranium, rare earths. And, and so that's why these things are being added to these critical minerals lists. The, it, it's clearly a signal of the marketplace that governments um, view this as a national security issue or uh, economic they have an economic interest in terms of moving these these projects. The big issue, I, I think, is is capital and permitting and time. Um, it's taken historically very long periods of time to get these projects approved uh, through the environmental permitting process. And, and the capital raising, as I mentioned, is really, really significant for some projects. Um, and, you know, anytime you can condense the period of time between, you know, Starting a project and, and delivering cash flows is very meaningful in terms of economic returns to to shareholders. And, and it's, you know, in Canada, for example, where you and I live, it's nice that our government is openly admitting they need to streamline the mining approval process, that it is very onerous doing it at both the provincial and, and federal government levels. Um, and look, we don't, we're not advocating that we fast track and cut corners. We want Canada to remain a tier one. Uh, mining jurisdiction, but there clearly can be improvements to the, the permitting process, no doubt. Right. Okay. And so certainly at the government level, this is moving forward. Things are happening. All right. I want to look a little bit more closely now at the demand side. So this is pretty interesting. I know that for the long term, as we've been speaking about, these green energy applications are going to be really important for copper demand. But one thing I've been hearing recently, at least in the short term, is, you know, we've had concerns about recession, either in China or at other places in the world. Recently, I've been seeing headlines about deflation in China. So I wondered if you could weigh in on kind of those short term copper demand possible dynamics. Yeah, I mean, you raise a really good point because the in China, um, you know, as I mentioned, half the copper ends up going there for, for either processing or end use. The, the Chinese real estate market is really, the bubble is blown. Um, a lot of speculation uh, in the in the real estate market um, has, has has ended up on, on um, you know, uh, on the wrong side of the trade. And, and, and that obviously is having some impact on copper demand. But I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, copper demand has been incredibly resilient because of these other emerging use cases that are mostly related to electrification. If you look at the forward projections, yes, we need more copper for things like solar and uh, wind farms and, and those things. But the two most material uh, incremental uses of copper that we're going to see in the next 20 years are gonna be electric vehicles, which have over two times as much copper relative to a gasoline powered uh, vehicle. And the second thing is transmission. So everything from energy grids, cabling, Think about how much copper is in a data center as we move everything to the cloud, as the world is moving towards AI. Um, these are very energy intensive. So there's a tie back to uranium again and stable, you know, 24 seven power, but also all of the wiring and cabling in the, in these facilities is quite meaningful. So we, we expect that every, uh, everything from long range transmission to shorter term in ground cabling for greater electrification uh, is going to wrap both of those things and electric vehicles are going to to account for most of the incremental lift in reigning demand. Again, this isn't tomorrow, but over the next 20, 30 years. Right. And as we're as we're getting a little bit closer to the end here, I wondered if we could look forward a little bit less long term at 2024. And just get your your thoughts on copper moving forward in 2024, and any any key developments we should look for. Yeah, well, we've been watching very carefully these um, Chinese smelting charges for for uh, treatment and refining of copper because it's it's really uh, to to borrow the old uh, saying, the canary coal mine, in terms of indicating to us the scarcity of copper concentrated in that market. In in part because demand has been very durable related to some of these energy transition technologies, but also because we've had some some supply bumps in the road. Uh, Coburg, Panama, I mean, I think that was 3% global output alone. That mine's been closed. Um, so it does 
tell you the market is fairly tight when just a few bumps at, at specific mine sites can can tighten the market up as, as much as it, it has. So we're watching for that. That if you look at that uh, signal, um, and I, I, re I recently um, read some some good research from the Bank of Montreal that said in the last three occasions when those treatment charges, copper treatment charges in China fell to these very low levels, signaling market tightness, that in the subsequent six months that the price of copper has rallied anywhere from 10 to 24 uh, percent. And I think it's fair to say that those, you know, again, history sometimes repeats. Um, and those three uh, past instances is exactly what's kind of setting up right now. And copper's just starting to move. So we would not be surprised in the next six to 12 months if the copper price is, is higher by, you know, 10 to 20 percent. Right. And okay, that perfectly answers, I think, what was going to be my next question, which was for investors, you know, is now the time to enter the market? It sounds like it's certainly time to start thinking about it. So before I let you go, I'll just put it back to you. Copper is a less familiar market to me and, and possibly for our audience. I wondered if there's any final points that you think people should be more aware of that they might not have known to consider when it comes to copper. Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, when I mean, you think about copper, I mean, all of us understand what it is. Um, and, it, you know, it's part of our daily lives. Um, you don't always see it, but it's it's there. I, I think I would just leave you with the message that the role of copper is, is no longer for plumbing and, and making pennies. Those days are long gone. Um, it has a very important role for electrification. And it's going to play a much more important role over the coming decades. And it is further behind the curve in terms of where it is in its particular uh, uh, cycle. And, you know, every commodity is at a slightly different point uh, of the cycle. Copper, I think, is just starting to emerge out of a bit of a slumber, which I think makes it interesting. We're starting to see some institutional investors reallocate to copper uh, after a little bit of a hiatus. There was a lot of excitement about copper at the beginning of 2023, when the Chinese economy was finally reopening from COVID, that that turned out to be disappointing because the, the construction sector just didn't take off. Um, but we're starting to see signs and uh, interest come back. And we're starting to see some pretty uh, sizable capital starting to poke around. There have been a number of sizable uh, equity raises for copper companies, which I think is very healthy because generally it's been hard to raise a lot of capital in the last couple of years in mining. Okay. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Thank you for coming on to go over what's going on with copper, supply, demand, prices. I think this is a really great place to begin. Thanks for having me. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is John Champaglia with Sprott Asset Management. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.